this is the worst uh, world, right, for, for Central Bank. There's a lot going on, and, and frankly, it's getting easier to be bearish. A lot of the weakness under the surface predated the invasion. The dollar or treasuries as a risk-free asset isn't so risk-free. It's not risk-free if you're Russian, and maybe if you're Chinese, you're like, it might not be risk-free either. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller, and Kaylee Lines. It's 9 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong on this Wednesday, March 16th. Our top stories today. China gives stocks a booster shot. Chinese equities soar after Beijing pledges to support markets and stimulate economic growth. President Biden heads to Europe next week to meet with NATO allies on the war in Ukraine. And today, Ukraine's president will deliver a virtual address to the U.S. Congress. And the Federal Reserve is poised to raise interest rates to help contain inflation. Meanwhile, President Biden's pick to be the, the, to be the top banking regulator has bowed out after failing to win enough support in the Senate. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kayleigh Lines in New York. And Kayleigh, we spend a lot of time, of course, talking about war in Europe. From a markets perspective, it is the commentary, the verbal intervention from China that is really worth talking about this morning. Yeah, absolutely. Stepping in to stop the plunge we have, plunge we have seen in Chinese assets. And I'll get to that in just a moment. I do want to, though, quickly touch on some breaking news out of the IEA, which has uh, says that its Russian oil output forecast will be slumping by a quarter next month. They say 3 million barrels of Russian oil output potentially shut in from April. They're also revising down their 2022 global oil demand forecast by 950,000 barrels a day. Not too much reaction, though, when it comes to oil prices. We did, though, see a big reaction across Asian assets to that commentary we got out of China. Beijing pledging to support financial markets, support the economy, talk to U.S. regulators about ADR, support uh, overseas listings, all of that leading to a huge boost in risk sentiment in Asia. You the MSCI Asia Pacific Index as a whole up more than three percentage points, the best day for it since back in 2020, but really massive moves when it comes to some specific indices in Hong Kong and China. The Hang Seng China Enterprise Index was up 12 and a half percent, the best day since 2008, and the Hang Seng Tech Index was up 22 percentage points in one single session. That is by far the best day ever. You had the likes of Tencent up 23 percent, JD.com up by more than 30 percent, just massive, massive moves. And I point out it wasn't just limited to equities. The commentary about supporting the economy also giving a lift to some commodities, including which was up about 8% for those futures in Singapore, trading just south of $150 a ton, Matt. All right, very interesting stuff indeed. Green across the screen there. We have green here and futures as well. After the late day rally yesterday, up more than 2% on the S&P. Futures are up now more than 1%. Um, the 20, uh, the 10-year yield, I should say, uh, rising to two spot, 1670. So the Treasury's uh, yields are rising as investors feel comfortable enough to let go of that debt. That's why it's red. New York crude up 160, but still under 100 at 97.98. And Bitcoin just over 40,000 right now. Of course, um, we talk so much about how coral Related this is um, with risk assets, $40,432 for a Bitcoin today. Anna? Uh, let's have a look at the European uh, map then, Matt, and it is really positive. We have a move to the upside for European stocks, really coming off the back of what Kaylee was talking about there. But even before we got those supportive lines coming through from, uh, from China, verbal intervention at least at this point, even before that, the European equity markets missed out on the late-in-the-day rally we saw stateside, so already had a little bit of catch-up. We're now up by more than 2.5% on the CAC 40 and on the Zetradax. Uh, let me roll across and show you a little bit of the read-across that we're seeing into other assets here and actually focus in first on on nickel, we've seen the resumption of trading at the London Metals Exchange, although if you blinked, you missed it because it didn't last long. They came back with a 5% limit down, limit up uh, sort of control around the markets, but that didn't seem to go all that well. They've now had to suspend trading once again. As you can see, we're down by 8.3% on the nickel price, which doesn't seem to make sense given the limits that should be in place. So some technical questions about whether that limit is actually working. So we'll wait to see about resumption there. This is the Asia story uh, that Kaylee went through there and that positivity coming through into Europe because this is a business that's based in the Netherlands but owns a big stake in Tencent, the Chinese tech name, of course, and so as a result, up by 18.6%. Avast, this is a cybersecurity business. Norton LifeLock, which is a U.S. cyber business, has made an offer for this company, but it looks as if that might uh, get referred to competition authorities, take a little bit more time to get done, uh, and so the stock trades to the downside. And EQT in the private equity space, this is a really interesting story. This is the biggest private equity deal we're seeing to buy another private equity deal. This is EQT 
buying an Asian business, the Bearings Asia PE business. And as a result, even the acquirer moving to the upside up by just shy of 8%, Kaylee. All right, some interesting stocks to watch in today's session, Anna. There's also a lot more to watch throughout the day. It's going to be a big Wednesday. First, we have Ukrainian President Zelensky addressing the U.S. Congress at 9 a.m. New York time. So the war in Ukraine front and center there. Then when it comes to Russia, it faces its first foreign currency bond payment since in, in, in its invasion of Ukraine. And remember, if it pays in rubles, that still counts as a default. And finally, it is the Fed day as well. Its rate decision will be coming at 2 p.m. New York time. Of course, a 25 basis point hike essentially priced in, Matt. All right, we will definitely be focusing on that throughout the day. Right now, I want to get to our global coverage of what's going on around the world from Hong Kong, Brussels, Medica, Poland, Washington, D.C., and London, England. We begin with Enda Kern, our chief Asia correspondent after China unveiled a more market-friendly uh, policy stance, market-friendly to say the least. Enda, this is really, I think, you know, until we get to the Fed, this has to be the main market story of the day. What happened? It's a major development. It's actually a very unusual statement as well, Matt. It's coming from the top of the economic policy-making team in Beijing. Essentially, they're saying there is going to be support for the economy. There will be support for the markets. And that's a very unusual, explicit mention of support for the markets. They're promising better communication of how policies will impact markets. And then on the row with U.S. regulators over delisting of Chinese companies there and access to the books in China, they're saying they're making progress on that front. So, you know, it's a pretty bullish statement that was light on specifics, light on detail in terms of what policies will they be bringing along to support the markets and to support the economy. But you can see the reaction already, that huge rally in both Hong Kong and Chinese stocks. It is an unusual statement and it does point to China focusing on stability this year above all else. Yeah, verbal intervention then from China having a really big impact through the Asia session and filtering through globally to some extent. Enda, thank you. Uh, Enda Curran, our chief Asia correspondent. Back to the war in Europe. And President Biden will travel to Brussels next week to meet with NATO allies and take part in a summit of EU leaders as Russia presses on with its invasion of Ukraine. It comes as NATO defence ministers are due to meet today to discuss the crisis. Let's get more with our European correspondent Maria Tadeo, who joins us now from Brussels at the NATO headquarters. What's the top of the agenda for NATO ministers, Maria? Well, Anna, we just heard from the Secretary General, again, repeating its Article 5, this idea that if one member state gets attacked, it would be an attack on all. And he repeated there should be no miscalculation or misunderstanding of that principle by Moscow. The other big issue, of course, is Ukraine. And it's interesting because this is just happening a few hours after President Zelensky kind of hinted that the country has had a major reality check when it comes to NATO membership with the Ukrainian President Hinton and, and signaling that this uh, end Entry to the alliance over the short term now looks very complicated and perhaps Ukraine should be turning to other forms of security around perhaps neutrality but with guarantees from countries around it the big powers of the world and of course Russia this is negotiations continue it is also worth noting and pointing that today we heard from the Russian foreign minister Sergei Lavrov saying the talks are difficult but we see that there are some areas in which there could be a possible compromise that also reflects the language from Zelensky yesterday night saying the positions in the talks are now more realistic although more time is needed to get to a deal. All right, Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo in Brussels. Thank you so much. Now, of course, in show of support for Ukraine, the prime ministers of Poland, the Czech Republic, and Slovenia visited the country's capital, Kyiv, yesterday to meet with President Vladimir Zelensky. Let's get more with Bloomberg's Aggie Cantrell, who joins us from the <coughs> Polish-Ukrainian border. Aggie, what was the significance of this visit and what came out of it? Yes, it's difficult to actually overstate the significance of such a visit like this. This is three European leaders going to the center of a war zone, essentially, um, in order to express their solidarity with the Ukrainian people and with President Zelensky, not only from these three European nations, Poland, Czech Republic and Slovenia, but also from the U European Union as a whole. Um, it's uh, what came out of the talk was specifically this need to show that the European Union is going to stand alongside the Ukrainian people in this fight. And it's important to also think of it in the context of which countries went. Poland is a country which also has a very long history with Russia as well and has been warning against the security concerns that the war in Kiev, uh, the war in Ukraine means for the, the rest of Europe.
and also where I am right now there are many many refugees still coming over the border into Poland this is something that is affecting Poland clearly by the fact that they've already taken in 1.8 million of the 3 million refugees that are coming from Ukraine into the European Union. Aggie thanks very much Aggie Cantrell there reporting from the Poland Ukraine border. Now Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is set to make a virtual speech today to both chambers of Congress in the U.S. Meanwhile, on the domestic front, Sarah Bloom Raskin has withdrawn as President Biden's nominee to be the next Fed vice chair of supervision. This comes after it became clear that Raskin did not have the votes to be confirmed. Bloomberg Washington correspondent Anne-Marie Horner joins us from D.C. all over both of these stories. So, Anne-Marie, first of all, what do we know about this virtual address? Well, Matt, it's likely going to be incredibly impassioned and emotional, and President Zelensky is really going to try to implore Congress to move on his demands that the administration so far has not been willing to cross. And when you think of those demands, one is going to be, of course, those Polish fighter jets and also a no-fly zone. But just yesterday, when President's press secretary, Jen Psaki, was asked about this, she said that a no-fly zone basically means the United States shooting at Russian jets. The president last week called that quote, that's World War III. This is something the administration has not been willing to do, but we've heard from President Zelensky in a number of addresses, most recently to C Canada's parliament, saying, please close the skies. And that's what you're going to expect today. Amory, thanks very much. Amory Horden joining us there from Washington. Now, months of speculation about a new wave of rate hikes look to be coming to a head today when the Fed is expected to begin tightening. The central bank will seek to rein in decades-high inflation that's being exacerbated by high commodity prices. Um, let us get more details on that with Bloomberg's Danny Berger. Good morning, Danny. Good morning, Anna. Look, it's going to be an interesting meeting. Yes, it's been broadcast. We'll move 25 basis points today. Uh. But what will we learn about the pace of rate hikes to come? It's a very strange point to be tight, uh, to be hiking at this moment, considering bond yields look to be near a high. Uh, I have a chart in front of me for our radio listening audience uh, that Valerie Sarasulo, our markets editor, put together for us that does such a good job of encapsulating what a weird point in the cycle this is. It's U.S. financial conditions, which have been tight in fact, they're so tight, they are at the same level that they were back in 2018 when the Fed decides to stop their path of hiking and stays where they are. But yet, we're about to start hiking. And not only that, the market sees seven hikes as well. It's despite a war in Ukraine that has growth concerns that many thought would give the Fed the ability to pause and reflect and some of the market doing some of the work for them. But of course, that war has also brought more of an inflationary impact. Commodity prices have been moving higher. Yes, there's been some back and forth, but now we have verbal, at least for now, support from China to growth. And so that's caused commodity prices to move higher again. It's another, yet again, another inflationary force that the Fed has to deal with. Now, I do have a commodities board up in front of me, so I kind of have to mention nickel. So let me take a pause. Let me take a beat right here. Anna, you mentioned it before, but we do see the price of nickel as down 8%. The issue with this is that the LME opened nickel again, saying that they had a 5% band. It moves below that. Three trades went through that were below 5%. LME says we have a problem with our band. We're investigating, of course, the LME just announcing they're going to cancel those trades that went below 5%. This, of course, comes after much criticism of them canceling an entire day's worth of trading, Kaylee. Yeah, it's still not working properly. Pro properly. The LME says a systems error allowed those trades to be below the lower limit. Thank you so much to Bloomberg's Danny Berger for that great breakdown. Now let's get back to the U.S. markets. Take a look at some stocks moving in pre-market trading here in the U.S. All of them basically related to that China intervention story because as you saw Chinese tech stocks higher in the Asian session overnight, you're seeing the same thing with those ADRs in pre-market trading here in the U.S. Alibaba, JD.com, each higher by 20%. Didi Global, the Chinese ride-hailing company, up 34%. You're also seeing a lift for U.S.-based casino operators like Wynn and Las Vegas Sands that also have a large presence in Macau. Maybe more support for the economy means more people are going to be going to that enclave to gamble. As a result, both of those stocks higher by 7% in early hours, Anna. Okay, when we come back, Kaylee, we'll talk to Manish Singh, Crossbridge Capital CIO. We seem to have gone from bear market to bull market in Chinese tech stocks in just one day. Where does that leave Manish and his strategy? We will also talk geopolitics with Elizabeth Braw, American Enterprise Institute resident fellow. Lots to discuss there about the role that NATO should be playing as we wait for President Biden to visit Europe next week. Plus, stay with Bloomberg for our coverage of the Fed decision and news conference. It all starts at 1.30 p.m. in New York, 5.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg.
Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. We are simulcast on Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Television. I'm Matt Miller here in New York with Kaylee Lines, Anna Edwards out in London. I am showing a chart for those of you listening on radio that Danny Berger just walked us through and Anna used yesterday. But the reason I'm repeating this chart is that I think it's probably the best chart that we've had. Valerie Sarasulo uh, made this for us since Hillary Clark's now notorious QE flags like seven or eight years ago. It just says <laughs> so much without being too busy. It's elegant, uh, I think. And for those of you listening on radio, it shows financial conditions, the huge drop we had in uh, March of 2020. Um, the drop that we're looking at right now in terms of financial conditions, because we have gone negative over the past few weeks since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, it mirrors the kind of drop that we saw in 2018. And that's when the Fed was raising rates, right? But they had to do an about face and come back um, before we got to even before we got to the pandemic. Um, so I think it's really interesting. 4960 is the number here. G hashtag BTV space 4960. If you're listening in your car, pull over, write that down and check it out when you get to the office. Justina Lee joins us right now. Bloomberg Markets reporter to talk about the Fed today. We still expect an increase, Justina, but I think um, even though WERP shows us seven um, 25 basis point hikes through February of 2023, the thinking that a recession could happen next year is starting to really gain some momentum. Yeah, I mean, the Fed is really on, in a bind here because on one hand, you know, commodity prices have risen. Inflation is at the highest in four decades. And so they've got to worry about that. But at the same time, the war has also increased economic risks. And it's really up to the Fed to kind of balance those two, you know, factors right here. And, you know, economists are still expecting the dot plot to show more rate hikes than it did in the last meeting, but still less than what markets are projecting. Uh, Justina, and the other thing we need to talk about today, of course, is what we've seen through the Asia session, this incredible turnaround in Chinese stocks and Hong Kong technology shares in particular. There's a lot of a verbal intervention here. I guess we wait to find out whether that's followed up with, with anything more, more substantial. But there are also questions we still don't know the answer to. For example, what role will China play in the Russia-Ukraine conflict? How far will lockdowns go in China fighting COVID-19 still? So even with this intervention, and that is the story of the moment, still questions. Yeah, exactly. But it seems like investors were happy to take, you know, just the verbal support for now, especially since they had been waiting for this all this time. Chinese stocks were plunging and it really was quite a remarkable message coming from Beijing. Not only did they tell government departments to actively introduce policies to benefit markets, they actually very specifically hit a few pain points, you know, of markets kind of assuaging these concerns from U.S. listings to, you know, the tech crackdown and the housing market risk. Yeah, absolutely. Something in there around tech, around property around all of those different uh, those uh, worries on the on the worry list justina thank you very much bloomberg's justina lee with the latest on markets and for more market analysis check out mliv go on your bloomberg terminal this is bloomberg Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines with Matt Miller in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Now keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. China denies it knew about the invasion of Ukraine in advance. In the Washington Post, China's ambassador to the U.S. wrote that had Beijing known about Russia's plan, it would have tried its best to prevent it. He says that assertions that China tacitly supports the war are disinformation. Fitch Ratings says that Russia could be in default today. The firm says it needs to make the coupon payments on its dollar debt that are due today in dollars. Moscow has said that creditors in countries that had joined sanctions against Russia would be treated differently. Top Republican senators are urging the Biden administration to speed up the delivery of weapons and equipment to Ukraine. They suggested a long list in addition to high-profile weapons such as handheld anti-aircraft and anti-tank missiles. That list includes drones, grenade launchers and rocket systems. And Pfizer has asked U.S. regulators to approve a second coronavirus booster shot for senior citizens. It's an attempt to protect vulnerable adults when immunity provided by the first three doses decreases. Pfizer and its German partner BioNTech submitted data from Israel, which started giving a fourth shot to older people and healthcare workers last year. Because yes, Anna, with everything else going on, we are still in the middle of a pandemic.
Yeah, mm. absolutely. And just the news flow yesterday out of China reminded us of that, didn't it, Kaylee? And speaking of China, uh, further news flow, further verbal intervention in markets from Chinese authorities, certainly something we want to discuss with Manish Singh, Crossbridge Capital's CIO. That conversation coming up shortly. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. In China, stocks soared after Beijing pledged, pledged to boost financial markets and stimulate economic growth. Hong Kong's China stock gauge rose the most in 14 years. China is trying to ease investor fears on risks from the property market, overseas listings and internet companies. President Biden heads to Brussels next week to meet with NATO allies and take part in a European Union summit. Both meetings will focus on Russia's war in Ukraine. Today, Ukraine's president will deliver a virtual address to the U.S. Congress. And the Federal Reserve is poised to raise interest rates today for the first time since 2018. Investors will focus on how aggressive the central bank plans to be in taking on inflation. Meanwhile, President Biden's pick for the top U.S. banking regulator has withdrawn. Sarah Bloom Raskin failed to gain enough support in the Senate. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Kaylee Lines and Matt Miller over in New York. And Matt, what is on your mind as we head towards what looks to be a pretty positive session for the U.S.? Yeah, and I think um, we're moving so far ahead in futures. It's really interesting because typically traders will sit on their hands until we get the decision. But maybe today is different because we basically know what the decision is going to be. S&P futures up more than 1%, even after uh, the more than 2% uh, close uh, positive close yesterday. The U.S. 10-year yield is rising, even though this is red. It may confuse you to see an up arrow and the color red. I'm lobbying to change that. 2.16. Uh, five two is the level on the 10 year. So relatively high there as investors sell off the debt. The price is lower. That's why it's red. NYMEX crude is up almost 2% here. 9817, 98.22, still under $100 a barrel, but it's back uh, up again. And Bitcoin is rising today again as well. Two and three quarters percent right now, $40,540. Kaylee, what do you see in terms of pre-market movers? Well, of course, everything we're seeing in the U.S., Matt, follows on those massive, massive gains we saw in Asia overnight on Beijing's intervention to stop the plunge in asset prices there. And that is translating right through to Chinese listed stocks here in the U.S. The ADRs of the likes of Alibaba and JD.com surging in pre-market trading to the tune of 20% or more in the case of a few other names. And then other Chinese exposed stocks like Yum China is up 9.9%. And I wanted to point out Tesla as well. We, of course, got the news yesterday that it was raising prices on all of its vehicles. Again, now the cheapest car is just under $47,000. But the market seems to like that exercising of pricing power. Tesla was up nearly 5% yesterday, and it's up another 3% before the bell this morning, Anna. Something else that is uh, trading strongly today. European stocks broadly across the board responding to Kaylee the... Uh support the verbal intervention that we've seen from Chinese authorities around their assets. And so that is spilling through into the European equity trading day. The stock 600 in Europe up by just over 2%. We had a restart to nickel trading. Remember, of course, that nickel trading was stopped on the LME, the London Metals uh, Exchange, just last week. It was stopped because of that massive short squeeze that we saw. They tried to restart it this morning. The restart was supposed to have a 5% limit down limit, uh, but that didn't work properly. Technically, it went a bit wrong. And uh, as a result, we're paused again on nickel trading here in London. Process, this is another one that's really responding to the China news flow. Process owns a large chunk of Tencent over in China. Tencent went up by more than 20% in session in China. And so as a result, the process share price in Amsterdam up by 20%. And EQT, this is more M&A news, which uh, is gradually coming back into these markets, uh, such volatile markets because of the war in Europe, of course. EQT is a private equity business in, uh, in Scandinavia. It's buying another private equity business. In fact, it's the biggest such PE deal that we have ever seen as as a result, that stock up by just shy of 8%, Kaylee. All right, Anna, a lot going on today, and it's going to get even busier this afternoon because the first Fed rate increase since 2018 is eminent. The FOMC will almost certainly hike by 25 basis points today, but inflation is surging and uncertainty around the impact from the war in Ukraine complicates the case for faster tightening. Michael McKee, Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Correspondent, joins us now for more. So, Mike, is it fair to say it's not so much about the actual hike today, it's about everything else we hear from the Fed. 
Yeah, we know what the what is. The Fed is going to raise interest rates by 25 basis points today. Chairman Jay Powell told us that. It's the what's next that really matters. We're going to get new economic projections from the members of the Open Market Committee, and we're going to get a new dot plot. And then we get Chairman Powell explaining it all. And you look at the dot plot, uh, and it, it basically going into the December meeting or coming out from the December meeting, the market was pricing the long-term rise in rates lower than Fed officials were, and now they're pricing it significantly higher. So does the Fed go up to meet the markets? How far do they go? And also watch the dots on the far right of the dot plot when you get it, because that's the terminal rate. Do they raise that? Do they think we need to go over two and a half? Now, it do, we don't need to talk too much about Sarah Bloom Raskin herself. She's withdrawn. But the two questions I think that are important, who um, will replace her in terms of a nomination? And will Sherrod Brown, senator from the great state of Ohio, um, actually disengage that uh, confirmation from the others? Because they still all have to go forward. Yeah, uh, he's going to vote on the four nominees who are still left. Of course, Jay Powell being one of them. Yeah. Quite important to get that through. Uh, also, Lael Brainerd, Philip Jefferson, and uh, we're uh, looking at, at uh, Lisa Cook to join the Fed. That'll probably happen fairly quickly, and they've got some Republican support. As to who replaces Sarah Raskin, that's a good question because it's proving very hard for the president to get a progressive into that seat. His uh, OCC nominee had to withdraw because Republicans opposed uh, her and also now Sarah Raskin. Uh, the problem for the Fed is this delays a lot of important things going forward. If they don't get somebody into that seat, uh, we're going to be looking at problems with the bank mergers and acquisitions, stress tests, how strict are they going to be. The supplementary leverage ratio is a big deal to the banking industry. That's going to sit on the sidelines. And of course, with Raskin's withdrawal, they kind of push climate change out of the picture. Mike, thank you very much. Bloomberg's Michael McKee with the latest on what we should expect from the Fed today. For more on the Fed's path ahead, we're joined by Manish Singh, CIO at Crossbridge Capital, with us on set here in London. Manish, very nice to speak to you this morning. There's a lot to talk about this morning. War in Europe, of course, uh, on everybody's minds. Clearly, there's a lot going on in Chinese equity markets in the, the last few days and certainly this morning. But let's linger on the Fed for just a moment because, uh, to, to Mike's point there, do you think that the market is going to have to come down to the Fed's way of seeing things in terms of the number of hikes that are priced in or will the dots take a jump to the upside Will we see uh, the Fed's dots come up to meet the market so I think the market will have to come down uh, from what I see so the Fed fund future rate at this time as you know is pricing in 6.8 hikes of 25 basis point if you look at the PPI number that we got yesterday I mean we are already seeing signs of slowdown so at, as per me I don't see how we can get more than three to four rate hikes this year because I mm. think that we are seeing as I'm not forecasting we'll have a recession but I think we have a slowdown coming and that will stop the Fed in, in its tracks and do you think the Fed will have to do less because financial conditions have tightened a bit already yes we can debate how tight or loose that leaves us on financial conditions but is that part of the rationale absolutely I mean if you look at we when we got the 7.5 percent CPI print I mean look where the 210 spreads are going it's always it's been going down because 7.9 is going down so I do not think that the market at least you know from what we are seeing it believes that you can have these many rate hikes or the market will be able to sustain that and, and I'm looking at the data when I look at data I see a slowdown coming and that will be the reason that Fed will use to say well we don't have to because inflation is not as big a problem that 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 we thought it would be yeah Matt, jump in. How, how much of a slowdown Manish I mean do you see the probability of a recession at more than 50 percent in 2023 I know Goldman Sachs recently said 35 percent and it just seemed so low considering the huge gain in commodities prices, the fact that um, the yield curve is so flat at a time when the Fed is expected to raise rates seven times into February 2023. So I don't think that the, the uh, probability of recession is as high as that. And therefore, I was pointing out to the two data I saw yesterday. So if you look at the PPI and the producer, because the input price finally makes it to the consumer as well, there if you see the goods in uh, uh, less energy and food, that is up 4.1%. Now, this number was growing at over 10% in middle of the pandemic. If you look at also the empire manufacturing numbers and the difference between new orders and inventory, the new orders are, I wouldn't say collapsing, but it's falling fast. So there is an adjustment going on. We'll see what the Fed says about 
financial conditions. So far, they have they have used the word it is accommodative. They have used the word that economic strength it continues to be economic strength. These are two things that I would like to see in Fed statement, and that gives me a cue where we are heading and how fast and how far Fed can go. But as uh, I said, I do not think that we are going to get six, seven hikes. Are we in the like middle it. of a pandemic? I had to take issue with that. Technically, I mean, yes. I'm, in the Western world, certainly this is endemic now. Aren't we through with this? We're not wearing masks. We're getting back on planes. We're staying in hotels. We're not wiping everything down. Um, isn't it over? Well, I, if you look at the uh, this morning when I came on the tube, it was packed. So I, I think that <laughs> the pandemic is not there. and It's endemic. So if you look at the, you try to get a booking for a restaurant for dinner in London, I mean, you'll find it hard to get booking on Thursday and Friday. So I <laughs> yeah. think it just tells you that these things are over and it is endemic and people have decided they will have to live with it. Well, but that's is, not is true. It, wait, wait tech, how, what's the technical definition of a pandemic? Ask the WHO, Matt. Okay. I'm not. I'm not a, <laughs> a biology or epidemiology expert, but I will continue to ask Manish about the markets because one place where the pandemic, or at least COVID-related restrictions, certainly isn't over is China. We saw that borne out this week, and yet you also have China stepping up, saying they will support financial markets. How do you view that the moves we saw from Beijing overnight? I think it was extremely positive, and as I, as I wrote in my note, I really get concerned when the U.S. and China they don't talk to each other. Now, the fact that they have been talking, and we had one round of discussion in, in Rome that, that we saw, and the statement from Vice Premier Liu He is very far-reaching because he is not only mentioning about stable market, he's also saying that the U.S. and Chinese regulators have been talking about offshore listing. They are going to promote offshore listing. He's also said that monetary policy should be eased. These are, these are extremely positive. So these discussions are going on. And I think China is, is also taking note of what happened to Russia. I mean, Russia prepared a fortress by getting off U.S. Treasury. And look what happened. I mean, it just collapsed in a, on a weekend. So China has to be extremely careful because U.S. is a massive buyer of Chinese goods. And buyers do have a lot of potential, as we saw in that, and also we saw in Brexit, Brexit discussions. Manish, thank you very much for your thoughts. Good to speak to you Thanks, this Anna. morning. Manish Singh, CIO at Crossbridge Capital. Coming up on the programme, uh, we will stick with war in Europe and get a further perspective on that. Elizabeth Braw, American Enterprise Institute resident fellow, joins us shortly. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, an exclusive interview with Irish Finance Minister Pascal Donahoe. That's at 11.30 in New York, 3.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. They are making absurd claims about biological labs and chemical weapons in Ukraine. This is just another lie. And we are concerned that Moscow could stage a false flag operation, possibly including chemical weapons. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg briefing the press earlier from Brussels. Joining us now is Elizabeth Braw, resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Elizabeth, thanks very much for joining us. It seems we have a fairly good understanding at the moment about where NATO will and won't go. At least there's been some disagreement around that, and, and that has clarified things. Do you think that is a moving piece, though? Do you think that the NATO response here is and will uh, evolve? And if so, do we have to wait for next week for that when we see President Biden in Europe? Yeah, so what has happened with NATO's response is that uh, it has clearly uh, has said very clearly that it's not going to intervene militarily, but uh, uh, to intervene militarily is sort of a, a gray zone. Does it mean uh, not sending? Uh, does it only mean not sending your own troops? Does it also mean not sending weapons? NATO member states have sent weapons, and then, of course, last week the issue came up of uh, would the Americans help the Poles uh, donate their MIGs uh, to Ukraine? In mm. the end, the Americans said no. They didn't want to take the risk of, of becoming um, more closely involved with this conflict. Why so not? It's, it's evolving, but. Uh, Elizabeth, I spoke with uh, yesterday on Bloomberg Radio. We spoke with the um, assistant 
uh, deputy of the um, uh, uh, m defense ministry um, in Ukraine. And he said, look, if you give us the MiGs, if we just get the hardware, we can institute a no-fly zone ourselves. We can operate um, those aircraft and we can uh, ensure that Russia doesn't gain the advantage in the skies. That's all we need is just the gear. So if we're already sending them, you know, thousands of anti-tank missiles, why don't we send them the planes as well? That's that's a, a legitimate question and clearly the, the, the question that the Ukrainians are asking and, in, and indeed the Poles. So the question is, who is going to to uh, assume the risk? The Poles are willing to assume the risk, but not by themselves. And somebody has to team up with them to essentially share the risk. And nobody wants to be that country. It really has to be a major NATO member state, i.e. Uh, the United States. And the U.S. isn't willing to sort of assume half of that risk. So uh, it's either everybody or nobody. And the Poles uh, are, are just not going to do it on their own. So, so that is sort of the, the catch-22 situation. Also with regards to, to, to the mix, they alone really wouldn't close the Ukrainian skies, as we saw with the attack on, on uh, that military base uh, near the Polish border. Uh, those aircraft didn't even uh, uh, fly into Ukrainian airspace. They uh, remained in Russian airspace. So uh, Ukraine wouldn't be completely safe, even if somebody managed to close our skies. Elizabeth, is Russia just reusing its playbook from Syria? And if so, how should the West respond differently now that it's Kiev and Kharkiv than, and not Aleppo? It, the, the sad uh, discovery of this war is really that, that Russia was practicing in Syria all these years, and we didn't really pay a lot of attention, uh, we as, as Europeans, because it wasn't uh, in, on our continent. Now it is on our continent, and the Russians have practiced um, and, and developed some skills, some destructive skills in Syria, and they are using them because of f their first plan, that plan A, to swiftly capture Ukraine didn't uh, succeed, and now they are resorting to plan B, which is very bloody. Uh, yeah. Almost... Uh, Paradoxically, at the same, the same time, it's conducting negotiations with the Ukrainians uh, to uh, establish a potential uh, uh, ceasefire. So, uh, really, a very bloody situation. Well, Elizabeth, as you talk about Plan B, do you think realistically that might include chemical weapons? It's very hard to tell when, when the leader of Russia is as irrational as he is. It, it, this war makes no sense, no rational sense, because it's damaging uh, Russia enormously, not least economically. But uh, Putin seems to have uh, succumbed to irrationality. And uh, as a result, it's very hard to... to uh, uh, to say whether or not he'll use chemical weapons. He, he's clearly uh, not in the business of, of worrying about loss of human life on, on either side. We should remember that thousands of soldiers uh, on the Russian side have already lost their lives in, in this uh, really quite unnecessary war. Is this why we're so, you know, we're so adamant that there aren't any bio labs in Ukraine, even though uh, the Undersecretary of State Victoria Nuland testified in front of Congress that there are, in fact, biological research labs in Ukraine. Is that why we're being so sort of over the top about our denials? So the, the challenge with, with biological labs is that they can exist for entirely peaceful purposes. Every country conducts biological research, uh, virological research, as, as we saw with, uh, with uh, China. Um, they had uh, in, in Wuhan this lab that then became almost infamous as, as a sort of a suspected source of, uh, of the COVID outbreak. I think uh, that has still not been established where, where, the, where the, that COVID outbreak came from. But nevertheless, countries conduct biological research not to, to uh, create weapons in most cases, but simply to, uh, for, for medical reasons. And in the case of Ukraine, uh, during Soviet times, uh, the Soviets did have biological labs for military reasons, and then came the end of the Soviet Union, and somebody had to convert those labs into something more peaceful. And that's uh, where the Americans came in and helped the Ukrainians and others to convert those labs, and that's why they still exist. And But it's, it's very hard to, to sort of explain that long story uh, uh, to counter Russian propaganda that makes it seem like Ukraine is developing uh, biological weapons.
Elizabeth, thank you very much. Thanks for bringing us uh, your, your thoughts. Elizabeth Braw, resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Coming up in programming, we will be speaking to the former U.S. ambassador to Georgia, Ian Kelly. That's at 8 a.m. in New York, 12 p.m. London time. This is Bloomberg. I think the biggest thing that's happened in the last 10 years in lots of ways, uh, maybe longer, is when Europe, the U.S. said, hey, Russia, those reserves that you thought were yours, they're not really your reserves. So what does that mean? It means the dollar or treasuries as a risk-free asset isn't so risk-free. It's not risk-free if you're Russian and maybe if you're Chinese, you're like, it might not be risk-free either. That was Galaxy Digital CEO Mike Novogratz speaking with me and Kaylee yesterday on Bloomberg Crypto. You can catch our new show every Tuesday. I'm going to go against Anna on this one and say that Tuesday is the best day. <laughs> the now best is, things though. happen on Tuesday, um, including our show every Tuesday at 1 p.m. It's improved, right? Uh, so yes. um, definitely recommend you tune in. We've gotten a lot of really positive feedback on Twitter, on LinkedIn, and uh, we, we learned a lot as well from Mike Novogratz yesterday. Now, with that said, let's get to Tom Keen, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance. Um, it is Fed Day. We're going to see uh, that not only... That was the worst shameless plug I think <laughs> I've ever seen. Anna, my deepest sympathies. I, I don't know how you do it. I, I was going to move on to plug <clears throat> The Fed Decides today, your aptly named special that starts at 1.30 p.m. And uh, the most important market event of the day... Um, from that time on, for sure. But for now, it's really China, right? They've almost issued a kind of whatever-it-takes memorandum. Yeah, I like that. I think the whatever-it-takes really captures the moment. There's three major stories going on. Of course, trumping all is the Zelensky speech to Congress, I believe, in the 9 o'clock hour across all of the Bloomberg uh, world. And yes, there will be a Fed meeting in China as well. Let's look at a chart very quickly here. Uh, this is one measure of China. I've done this the way I look at it, not on TV. Usually, I'd have a white line big and bold for TV, but this is what's called a candle chart, and it shows you the more nuanced slope of the Hong Kong index, the Hang Seng, back to the time of JFK and the beginning of Vietnam, and the answer is there was a Hong Kong boom, and then, Matt, there wasn't, and Hong Kong goes flat, slope matters, and we rolled over a little bit, not quite to where we are in Hong Kong in the crisis of 2008. All right, Tom Keen, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance, thank you so much. And looking forward to your coverage of The Fed Decides later today. And on surveillance, I know you'll be joined by Ellen Zetner of Morgan Stanley. So looking forward to that conversation as well. Meanwhile, we continue, Anna, to get headlines out of China. The China Securities uh, Regulatory Commission saying encouraging listing firms to step up share buybacks so that intervention continues. A big market story of the day, Anna. Yeah, absolutely. So we continue to watch these lines coming out of China. Uh, yeah, Paul Dobson, our, our colleague, talking about this being a draggy moment, the whatever-it-takes moment from China. How long does it last? This is Bloomberg.